well, it started off with two or three people. It started about, off with three inputs. <laughs> and now, um, how, many, how many did you die? Is it 6,542 members? And we've been going 13 months. And it's a really dynamic space. And one that, <laughs> yeah. People are sharing their own photographs <laughs> and debating issues. We've been using it as a way of debating some of the political decision making that's going on within the city at the moment about heritage. So here's a bit of a cartoon of what we've been doing. Um, so I suppose we've been, we had a sort of backbone. It's interesting we've just been talking about the unexpected because we had a very, we had a research design that was really very much about taking advantage of opportunities that presented themselves. But we did have a backbone of events that kind of, I suppose, made me panic less about what we were doing in relation to the research. And Paul's walks, running the York a Walk on the World side walks, was a really crucial part of that. But we also had key events around decisions that were coming up within the city about Stonebow House that Leanne mentioned earlier on, the briefness building within the city that the council brought the freehold for. So it seemed as though a decision was going to be on the horizon. It hasn't materialised as yet, but we had a number of events around that. And similarly around the kind of castle area of York where um, there have been a range of different issues of planning over the years, including a public inquiry not so long ago, which is probably why the council is a little bit sensitive about the use of the word inquiry. Um, and so we had the sort of backbone of events. But a lot of what we were doing was really responding to opportunity and things that came about. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do in approaching the project, which really came out of our phase one research design, was to try and think about heritage and heritage decision making in a, in a systemic way. So to think about it as richly complex thing. So we've heard today in a really interesting way about all these different ways in which you might think about what heritage is. The thing that kind of was so, I think, so clear from all the papers we've heard is, is it's not one thing. It's a process. It's constantly being made. Um, it can't be thought of actually separately from all the ways the cities operate, you know, the people that you know, the kinds of conversations that you have, and the kind of institutions that seek to guard and, and manage heritage in a more overt way. So one of the things we were really keen to do in our research design was try to see heritage within the city of York, and we use heritage as, you know, in that complex way, like not in a one way, but from lots and lots of different pieces <coughs> of perspective. And um, to really see that we can't see, we can see heritage in an isolated way. We can see it in as only happening in one place, or with one type of material, or with one set of social relationships. So our research design was very much about trying to create lots of different opportunities for lots of different people to come into conversations with people they might not otherwise meet to talk about these kinds of issues. And the methods, as a result, we were trying to like really be within that. So to not claim that we're standing back and looking at these processes from the outside, but be within it and to try stuff out. And I suppose one of the ways we've come to think about our decision-making project generally is kind of, we call it research, and it is, but really it's been a social learning process. We've learned a lot from lots of different people's perspectives who've been on the team and that we've worked with in York. And also that of experimentation, so trying things out as part of that, and that going into a kind of you know, iterative cycle, really. Uh, yeah, I've learned that fact when you pass the fact that you use that, these fashions are different. It's, don't ever give up. It's easy to help to give up. Yeah, and I suppose like, yeah, so that actually that is uh, so important, isn't it? Because we haven't thought about knowledge and change as being separate processes. It's not like we've been trying to know about heritage in York, so we could then seek to change something about how decision making is made at some later date. We've seen knowledge and change as being kind of processes that are happening simultaneously. And this quote from Danny Burns, Systemic Action Research, really helps me with that. He says, each situation is unique, and its transformative potential lies in the relationship between interconnected people and organisations, and stuff, and all of that. <laughs> so I think that's been kind of really cool to the way we've been working. So um, just to illustrate that, one of the things we did as part of our research design um, is that we got together with a range of different people in Manchester at Mad Lab and um, Manchester Digital Laboratories, um, with Rachel Turner and Mad Lab being part of the co-design team. And we brought together people who were activists around history, history and heritage, people who work in various different types of heritage organisations, and academics that research it to try and explore and, and kind of um, excavate some of the kind of questions about decision making systems. And I suppose just to illustrate our point about heritage not being fixed or not being one thing. The big stream that you can see going through the illustration is what we thought of as being heritage. It's like this living stream. 
and um, often the kind of process of the decision making creates certain kind of blocks or sticking points or channels through which it's defined and given certain kinds of meaning. And so um, this has been quite an important touch point for our research. So um, one of the things, and I, you know, maybe I should make this look less messy, but it kind of um, sums up, I think, some of our processes. Because in the, in the kind of printed bits, which you probably can't read, really early on, we actually mapped the official decision-making structures around official heritage within the city. And then we started through lots of conversations through some public stalls that we ran, and these live inquiries we did at the library, to start to um, populate that kind of official decision-making system with all people's experiences of being part of it. Um, so um, <coughs> we'll come to the decision, the experience of being outside of those decision-making structures in a minute. But really early on in the process, um, I spoke to a lot of people who are in decision-making um, positions within the city. Um, and it became clear that there was a really strong sense, really felt sense in the sense that we absolutely couldn't ignore the people in decision-making positions felt quite attacked. They, you know, the, cuts, the public sector cuts are very real. They're affecting people's working lives. They're affecting their sense of their professionalism and their ability to work. So the sense of, of whatever they try never being good enough. Um, and also their sort of sense of the public debate within the city wasn't good enough for politicians in the sense to be able to use more participatory methods. And so we really were trying to recognize those as being key uh, and yes, yeah, sort of starting points for anything that we did within the city. And I suppose particular resistances to ideas of participation generally. The issues are too complicated for the public to get involved in them. Participation is never inclusive enough. It's only ever the usual suspects that participatory approaches ignores professional expertise and that it can't be scaled. And these things came up again and again and again in the kind of conversations we had early on in the process about how to open up decision making and create more participation within the city. Um, so that was on one side of these discussions, but then there was another side <coughs> which we were having within the live inquiries and in the public, we were running stalls outside um, Stoneborough House, for example, so we were having lots of conversations and on the Facebook group as well. And so I think that there was lots of things about people just trying people, to get in and not being able to. People feeling that they don't have, where the council, where the York City Council is concerned, I don't know if it's, it's true everywhere else. Um, a lot of people feel until they, 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 they don't have a voice, they're not allowed to go to the council and say, well, sorry, but we disagree. Um, um, uh, one, of the, one of the live inquiries, it was uh, either me or my husband that turned around and said, well, why? Why should it be that you're, you're a member of the public and you cannot go to your council and say, well, sorry, but I don't agree? Um, and it was then that we had a meeting with yeah. a, an MP came out particularly out of this the kind of experience you've had of trying to get into the hut with the Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the hut were buildings that were made in the 1940s um, and they were just quickly put up for soldiers to, to have somewhere to go um, if they were injured or if they just needed a little time out sort of space. Um, and there was a set of these hookments at the back of the museum, museum uh, the art gallery, sorry. Now, my husband is into old buildings, and he phoned to the art gallery and said, well, look, can we come and take some photos of these buildings? We don't want to damage them, we're not going to put any graffiti over anywhere, we just want to take photos. So the, the documented. The art gallery then turned around and said, no, it's a museum. The museum then said, no, go to the York City Council. The York City Council said, yes, if it was up to us, but it's not, it's the museum. Then we went back to the museum and they said, no, it's the art gallery. So basically, they've been pulled down now. There's been no documentation with them at all, apart from the fact that the museum had three pictures and one of them was usable. That was it. Um, which is then why me and my husband decided that we wanted to to help with public, public documentation. Um, it was one of, at one of the live events that John Oxley came, who was the city, city archaeologist, um, and we, we didn't hear anything from him for, for about three months after we put this proposal in place. Um, he came back to us with a great being smile on his face and said, yeah, let's do it. Let's have public documentation. 
which is absolutely fantastic. This is the, the spoke of the idea that you could get into buildings if traps were going to be changed or were going through the planning process or something was going to happen to them. Sorry, I should have explained that one. Yeah, <laughs> well, we've been doing it so much. <laughs> but that anyone could come in who wanted to and take photographs of it and add it to a kind of community developed record of the building, share memories about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, this is it. We, we're at the, in the process of trying to build an archive that's ready for the 21st century with videos, photos, podcasts, interviews, uh, public memories, and 3D imaging. Big ask, <laughs> big project. Well, that's that's what we're looking at, at starting. We've been in touch with the ar the archivist, mm -hmm. that's the yeah, who's lending us space in each library throughout throughout York, um, so we can get in touch with the public. So they they bring their photos, we scan them, put them digi digitally, save them, give them their copies back, their photos back, and then the digital photos are then put into a big storage. How it's going to work yet, we don't know. Where we're going to store them, we haven't got a clue at the moment. Um, it's something that we are just starting up. Yeah, but I think this is, that almost we've kind of, that's like the whole story of the last year, isn't it, actually? Yeah. And, um, but it's taken us, we've been reflecting a lot on how this has happened and how this has come about, going from maybe 12 emails and all of them being ignored or being passed from pillar to post, which was the experience not just with Richard and Leanne, but numbers of other people that we spoke to. Now, we, don't, we don't blame any particular city or institution. I think it's quite common that if you don't have an institutional lever or a funding lever, that, that, that you know, your email falls to the bottom of the pile for busy people who are under a lot of pressure. So this isn't about attributing blame. It is about oh, noticing oh. some of the social processes that go on and some of the exclusions and boundaries that are very difficult to cross. So what we've been doing is trying to experiment with how to breach them, I suppose. Um, so um, this is, yeah, I suppose this is just about how your last year's been um, and how it's developed. And that was a slide about the live inquiry that um, Leanne's just spoken about. Um, and that's the Guildhall where you've been doing yep. public documentation. Uh, since the 4th of October, um, we've been doing tours every week we allowed to take 15 people inside the guild hall and we have access to all areas where we go, we go up to the roof on the left hand, the left hand side because it's, that's the more stable side of the roof. Um, we go into the council chamber, um, we go down into the cellars. Um, unfortunately, We've only got the tours till the end of this year because the guild hall's been changed. But it's been so so bought. Certainly, the be it, it, it's, it's, it's getting taken over to the point of where yeah, it's going to be a digital art centre. So I suppose one of the things we're really interested in, and we haven't quite got there yet, and again, we do think the end of the story. <laughs> <at all. laughs> but um, is that we've been we've had a lot of success, haven't we, over the last year? Uh, pluralising the sense of who might know about different buildings and forthcoming decisions within the city. So it's, I think that we've done really well at increasing that sense that you know actually it's worth running you know, interesting participatory events in creative ways and getting more people involved in sharing what they know and actively documenting it. What we've always been interested in is how we can connect that into decision making processes within the city, how in a sense knowing about something and being able to share what you know about it puts you in a position where you may be able to engage more easily if the systems are changed and tweaked with the information <coughs> process. So for example, around every planning decision in every city around the country, there's a process through which the public can feed in. There's a very cold and um, arm's length kind of process at the moment. There's a planning portal. There are particular kinds of meetings that are happening in very official places. There's not a lot of fun. There's not a lot of life. And there's not a lot of history. There's not a lot of sharing. There's not a lot of social into it. In so, we need, so we're interested in how we can get these social spaces. They've been so powerful, haven't they? Both yeah. on Facebook and in live events. Yeah. With, with decision making processes. And we've got some thoughts about how we can do that, which is the kind of next step. Um, you're all from the Guild Hall, isn't it? But I suppose we really like. So, uh, so what we've been doing, just to sort of recap, I suppose, is we, we've been mapping the way in which decision making is supposed to work. 
and the way in which participation is, public participation is supposed to feed into those processes. We've been trying to capture the lived reality of that from lots of different perspectives. We've been noting where there are sort of boundaries and exclusions, or particular kinds of blocks. And they can be blocks around process. They can also, um, without naming any names, be blocks around particular people who aren't particularly committed to greater participation. So we've been noticing all of that and trying to work within that sort of system. So what we'd be really interested to hear about from, from all of you now is whether in either within your cities and not related to connected communities research projects, you've had experiences of trying to get involved in different decision making or institutions <coughs> and experience similar things, or whether in relationship to the connected communities research project you've been on, you've experienced certain kinds of places where you've reached boundaries or exclusions where it's difficult to get past it. Um, so it'd be really great if, if you could talk to the people around you. And I think probably it feeds on, it builds very well on the idea of the unexpected within research. So it'd be really interesting just to kind of capture whether you've had any similar experiences or whether they resonate with you. And then we'll kind of take that and try to build on it and sort of suggest some of the ways we found that might help, the things that have helped us, and then see if those resonate with you too. So if you could just talk with the people around you about can you, can you just clarify, say so public participation heritage, do you mean heritage decision making? Yeah, heritage decision making. Not heritage before. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, the points where decisions are really made about what counts as heritage, that's a total way of thinking about that. Um, so, I mean, obvious examples are around planning or listing or what gets collected by museums. Um, but do read it in a way that resonates with your experiences. 